All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. <clears throat> Is YouTube working correctly today? Everything seem okay? I'll wave my hands up and stuff a bit to... All right, yes, yes. Okay, cool. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to week four now. Um, so, some fun stuff this week, as I'm sure we're all hopefully already aware. Um, we lost Monday's lecture to the public holiday. The second public holiday that has messed with us this term already, but that's all right. Um, we, um, let me turn this off. We, um, ended up, uh, the, the, th the thing we chose to sort of work around Monday's lecture disappearing, um, was Tom produced a series of three videos. I believe we can probably find those, uh, in the lectures over here. So for the week four Monday lectures, it wasn't, um, this is not, oh, sorry, these are slides. The YouTube video here is not a single video, but instead is a, um, a small playlist, I believe. YouTube, there we go, um, where he did a, uh, a lecture on um, impulse struct blocks. So it's essentially uh, attaching functions, attaching methods uh, to act upon a struct. It's a very common sort of design pattern that you'll see in um, lots of, I mean, really most modern languages, but especially sort of tends towards the, um, the object oriented side of things. For example, we don't have this kind of scoping or like the dot operator in this sort of sense um, in a language like C, uh, but really just about any language that I can conceivably think of that's in like serious modern use today has an equivalent to this kind of idea and Rust is no exception. So uh, Tom did a quick 15 minute video on that. He also did a 20 minute video on infiltrate for struct blocks. So this is this idea of um, implementing this uh, shared functionality, these uh, shared uh, concepts uh, for for your own types. We're also gonna look at defining our own traits and using them in a more um, advanced setting next week. But um, I think he was just looking at doing things, some stuff like uh, the addition operation or the multiplication operation. Um, I don't recall if you got around to any more complicated traits than that, but mainly just to sort of support you in getting started with assignment one, because that um, is particularly helpful for something I'll mention in a minute. He also did an assignment one walkthrough. So assignment one, if you weren't aware of already, has now been released. You can find it here under assignments. Um, it is called Adventurers. Um, and uh, it is, it's due week seven Wednesday, I believe. I'll double check that. Uh, week seven, Wednesday at 5 p.m. Um, and just so you know, we plan to release assignment two, uh, week seven weekend, due week 10 Friday is our general plan as well. So just so you can sort of timetable out um, when you're gonna have assignments and stuff. So we, we give you a little break between the due date of assignment one and the release of assignment two. Um, and it's all about creating a little game um, the idea, you know, this idea of sort of creating a little exploring game is certainly uh, inspired uh, from, you know, from uh, other from other courses and um, other teaching materials. It's a very sort of common idea to make something like to, to give a task that's engaging and fun and interesting um, with also like, you know, potentially uh, with with quite scalable complexity, let's say. If you need an assignment that's really simple, really easy, then you could scale this kind of task way down and have it just be like, do a little bit of work. If you need some more meat to it, or if you need to, it to become sufficiently complex, then it's a, it's the kind of task that you can scale up to there. Um, we've gone for sort of like a, um, uh, to sort of like on the medium to high complexity range, I'd believe, like is how I'd sort of, uh, you know, phrase it for this assignment. In particular, there's a whole bunch of sort of little tasks here. It's been split up into uh, eight sort of sub parts for the, for the main sort of adventure game, part one. Um, some of these are basically like, you know, uh, like very, very simple, like something like this. 
should like once you understand the assignment and understand what you have to do something like this probably takes you you know two or three minutes to implement some other pieces might take a little bit more time um, but something I want to make incredibly clear is that uh, this assignment is at, at its sort of very core is like a design is a design assignment um, so it's one of those things where like, you know, we talk to a lot of students in the workshops and we go, oh, so you, 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 you've noticed that you have this option of, you know, doing something or that option and they go, oh, I'm just going to unwrap everywhere. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do that because that'll get me to an answer quickly. And, you know, we only have such a limited time in the workshops and in the, the context you're working in, that absolutely makes sense. Um, this is one place where I'm going to strongly suggest take like the long route here, like um, think about what you're doing and try and make a design that you are try and make a design you're genuinely proud of um, and um, you know uh, like most of the sort of critique is going to come from like uh, how you've how you've written your code in, in an assignment like this um, so there's there's a sort of first part where you're basically making a whole bunch of game features and then part two you get to make a completely separate crate um, which is the quest system. <clears throat> um, and the idea is that this quest system is su supposed to be like a library that you can, that you could use completely outside of um, this adventurer's assignment if you wanted to. Um, and uh, it's sort of about making this generic quest interface and how quests compose and all that. And again, it's very much about design. We don't, um, throughout this whole assignment, uh, there is there is a lot of sort of room for like feel free to do this how you like or feel free to do how do this how you feel is appropriate um, We're not sort of so like this must be done exactly this way This must be done exactly that way and we expect you to use this and that like a lot of the a lot of this for the most part is like do it how you want um, you know use your own common sense in terms of like uh, you know you just just use your general common sense when it comes to where you get leeway to do you know things your way um because for the most part again we're going to there is obviously some marks associated for um uh like us ascertaining that your program works at least uh, you know correctly for some definition of correct um but again a big part of this uh assessment is is about design and at the end of the day, a lot of it doesn't really matter exactly if you make if you make flowers green or if you make the grass blue or you know whatever the heck it is um, that we care very little about. It's more about the the sort of code you've written and, and how you wrote it essentially. Um, so the uh, the marking has been broken up into this table here, which comes down to mechanical style, functional correct correctness, and idiomatic design. Mechanical style is basically like um, you know, what you would consider to, a, a big chunk of what you consider to be style in something like comp 1511 or 1911, basically meaning uh, compile without warnings, without errors. Um, Clippy is a nice little tool. Clippy will give you, if you've seen that like Microsoft little uh, paperclip thing that offers you suggestions back in like Windows XP and stuff like that. Um, Clippy is like a little uh, um, a code advisor, I suppose. It looks over your project and goes, oh, hey, you've written this like this, but you might want to prefer rewriting it like that. It's it's a surprisingly clever program, so you might just want to give it a once over to see what it thinks. Um, general uh, formatting. If your format is uh, set, again, this is mostly a common sense thing. If you have sensible formatting, then like we'll be okay with it. If you go like, I don't want to leave this to a bit of chance or common sense or whatever, just run it through Rust format, right? This is just easy tooling that will just format your code idiomatically. Um, I somewhat famously am not a huge fan of auto formatters. And if you're sort of similar to me and that you that's like a hill that you will die on, if your style is sensible, then we're okay with it. Um, if your style is, uh, is, is like a nightmare, um, then you might end up losing marks here. Um, and then tests will also fall under, uh, oh, YouTube is not receiving enough video, but you actually are. You definitely are. Okay. Well, anyway, um, is Clippy part of Rust Analyzer? No. Uh, Clippy needs to be run ex uh, separately, but it's very simple. It's just like cargo, oops, cargo Clippy, or if you're on CSE 6991 cargo Clippy. 
um, and it'll just spit out suggestions there. It's quite nice. Um, so uh, yeah, and then having tests that pass essentially comes under this as well. We expect, I don't know why YouTube's getting upset. This is, it's getting plenty of, it's getting 10K. They're right. If this, let me know if the stream is looking particularly horrific at any point. Um, but it, I don't know, it seems fine, but YouTube keeps complaining on my other screen. Um, right, so we're expecting that like most students should be able to just get these these sort of like pretty easy marks. Um, and then we have the uh, functional correctness and idiomatic design parts here. So functional correctness is like, we want to make sure that your program works. Streams looking fine, cool. We want to make sure your program works. Um, you'll have to fill out a checklist of what you finished and and how to run your program and stuff like that. We'll just double check that, it, you know, we're not going to be trying to like, um, uh, you know, do horrible things to crash your program. We're just going to be like, you know, start your program, walk around, um, try and go off the map and make sure the camera follows them, stuff like that. We might modify your map slightly just to make sure it's not like fully hard coded or anything like that. But again, it's it should be pretty, when we're not doing like crazy exhaustive, exhaustive testing. Um, for the most part, then the real meat and potatoes. What I, you know, what I think about is this idiomatic design section here. And there's a lot of dot points that go into what we'd sort of uh, consider to be smart design. Tom has often referred to this as like design excellence. Um, having a read through these and clarifying anything that you don't fully understand on the course forum and stuff is, is I think, a, a very good idea. Um, but this is like so. This ends up accounting for 45 percent of the assignment and it really is sort of like the the biggest individual section so 45 percent across the um part one here and part two in total uh functional correctness 40 percent across the two and mechanical style is hopefully for the most part just like a free 15 percent if you uh if you just take the time to make sure it's doing the right you're doing the right thing cool okay fine now all right um this is meant to be easy marks. Okay, cool. All right, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. And Tom's also made a whole video rambling on about the assignment. So I'll leave it at there for now. You are always welcome to ask as many questions as you would like on the course forum. Um, and um, uh, if you need, like, generally we don't like to like go hunting through your code. This isn't sort of like 1511 where we have like, uh, where we have help sessions where you pull up your code and we sit through it and debug it with you. You're sort of expected to have the skills of debugging, um, you know, uh, down pat before getting, before making your way into this course. Um, but, uh, well, you're expected to be able to do that. And uh, more importantly, you're expected to be able to take a problem that you have and reduce that problem into some kind of uh, MCVE. Um, if you have heard of uh, this sort of terminology from Stack Overflow, minimal, complete, verifiable example. Or have they changed the? Have they changed it? Oh, MCVE, minimal, complete, verifiable example. Well, that's what I, that's what I often refer to refer to it as MCVE. So the idea being that like if you have a bug, or sort of like you know it won't compile or something like that or your program's not doing what you expect, we expect that you're able to sort of slowly bisect your program down to the part that's causing you a problem and then turn that into a general example that then you can post publicly on the course forum. Um, and then we're perfectly happy to sort of help you debug your code in that sense. Um, so generally we, we're not super keen on going hunting through your own individual code. Um, Again, ask general questions or turn your um, your issue, the code that's causing you, uh, you know, headaches, into a smaller example that you can post publicly, um, and uh, you know, sort of uh, talking about your code directly as a last resort. And you'll have to have run give on your code uh, for us to access it. Absolutely, never po post your accessible assignment code um, on the on the course forum. Do not do that. Um, but as a last resort, yeah, then make sure you've run given the code um, and that's how we can access it if, if it's absolutely needed. Um, cool, what else? Uh, auto marking is out. If you haven't seen the email or the announcement, you should be able to see your auto marking with class run Sturec. Um, I believe you can also do class run dash collect and then uh, like an activity name like lab01 
underscore Van Gogh or, you know, Lab, Lab, Lab Zero One underscore Picasso, let's say. Um, but Collect gets really upset. This is sort of like a technical thing where Give expects you to be able to sort of like... Give doesn't like to give directories, let's say. Um, but in Rust, generally, like, all projects end up being, like, a, a crate directory. So we went, okay, that's fine. We'll sort of set up additional tooling to tar up your crate, to take all the files in your crate and put them in a tarball. A tarball is sort of like a zip um, that is not compressed by default. Zips, zips sort of also have compression by default. Um, and tars have... Uh, tar is like a... Tarballs are a binary format, um, which includes, you know, all kinds of bytes and collect spits things out into less and stuff and things get upset. If you run collect, it might be like, oh, I'm not happy about this. I've spat this file out over here. Go check it there. Just sort of like try and follow your way through and eventually you'll find like, <laughs> you'll probably find a um, an output that's like, here's the marking, here's your mark, here's what you submitted. And there'll be like random bytes all over the place, then your code and random bytes and some other files that you submitted. And I think down near the bottom, you might get like auto marking output and stuff like that. If you're having trouble with it, just let us know. Um, but for the most part, like I can say that um, out of the, out of all submissions, the vast majority of them are getting a hundred percent anyway. Um, there's, you know, small things where people have submitted maybe completely broken code or um, code that wasn't sort of passing any of the auto tests and stuff like that. If that's the case, um, if you've put like work in, like genuine sort of work towards a solution, and um, uh, but you, uh, you know, the auto marking spat out a result of zero for you, you can just send us an email, send an email to the course account and say, hey, um, I got zero for this, but I feel like I should have gotten, you know, I'd, I'd like to be compensated for, you know, some marks for the work that I did put in, and usually we're fine with that. We'll have a we'll have a look manually and go, yeah, that's that's worth. 50%, that's worth 60%, that's worth 80%, you know, whatever it ends up being. Um, and we can manually adjust your mark. But th this is all just like auto marking. Um, there is also two exercises, as you know, from week two and week three set that were um, didn't have auto test. They're meant to be manually marked. Um, we'll uh, have a poke at them in the workshops this week and you'll get to be able to discuss your answers and... Um, you know, and talk to a tutor about it. This week's uh, workshop is going to be quite uh, different than usual. We strongly suggest everyone make it to uh, a workshop this week. If you are not able to make it to a workshop, or, you know, if you are not able to, or I feel the case for, for a subset of students, you choose not to, we're never going to force you to come to workshops. And in this sense as well, we are not going to force you to come to the workshops. You will still get graded. You will still get your mark. Um, but we're not, you won't have that sort of discussion and, and individual, well, somewhat individual feedback from, uh, tutors. You'll just end up getting given a mark. If you go, this mark seems wrong. I want it to be looked at again, then you'll still have a chance to say that. And we'll still be able to like, look at your mark again and, and discuss it if it's required. Um, but you might miss out on, you know, this is, if you choose not to come to the workshops, I think you're already aware of the fact that you might be missing out on some of the learning. And in that sense, you might miss out on some of the learning as you probably already know. Um, but we're never going to, we're never going to take marks away or anything like that if you don't come to, to workshops and stuff like that. Okay. So any more, does, does anyone have any sort of more general questions um, uh, before we get stuck into stuff? As I've mentioned, I think like, 15 times by this point. Um, the content this week is pretty like tame, pretty tame compared to the previous weeks, which is why I'm not so fussed about, you know, going slow and dilly dallying and not doing too much. Um, and in particular, a lot of the concepts that we're looking at this week, especially in terms of like testing, you know, unit testing or, um, or testing in general or, you know, principles around documenting code, we're not going to like be discussing at length. It's more about like, how do you do this in Rust? And we're expecting you understand what a unit test is um, or like have done some amount of unit testing in say something like comp 1531 or, um, or I don't know, comp 2521, I think has uh, a, some semblance of unit testing in that. We're mainly going to be looking at how Rust does things. Um, and so it's, I'll be poking at different bits of documentation and showing you where to go when you have, when you're not sure what to do and that kind of stuff. 
and yeah, I expect it to be pretty chill today. Um, and lots of room for questions, even lots of, lots of room for questions about previous week's content and stuff like that as well, I reckon, um, throughout the rest of this. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so I guess we'll get into things. Um, we're mainly just looking at modularity, testing, documentation, and documentation tests. This is the one thing that might be new to some people, um, but some languages, uh, again, like most things in Rust, most things in Rust aren't particularly new ideas. Um, they're, they're simply stolen from, you know, other places. Um, even things like, uh, like uh, borrow checking and stuff like that, where it's like, okay, that's Rust's killer feature. Mm, Rust stole the idea of region analysis from a research language called Cyclone. In fact, I think if you go to um, Cyclone language, um, here, cyclone.thelanguage.org. Cyclone is a safe dialect of C. Um, blah, blah, blah. Cyclone is no longer supported. The core research project is finished. The developers have moved on. Several of Cyclone's ideas have made their way into Rust. So that's that's a fun one. Um, Rust's sort of main killer feature is, you know, also not from Rust. R most of Rust's ideas come from all different kinds of languages, just sort of, uh, you know, amalgamated into one, one big thing. Um, okay, so we'll get stuck into it then. Modularity in Rust. Um, most, um, let's say, most relatively modern languages, and by that I mean languages made in the last, uh, let's say languages introduced in like the last 30 years, generally, um, have some, uh, some feature set to describe the idea of modularity. Um, in particular, modularity often encompasses the idea of multiple files in a single project, right? Um, however, in some languages you can have, um, how do I say, you can have multiple files without extensive language support for it. So C is a pretty good example in this case where C you can absolutely have projects and it's incredibly common to have projects that have many files. Um, but the language doesn't have, like the programming language itself doesn't have much, um, much in the way of tooling inbuilt for it. So, um, you know, and see the compilers may support it, go like, you can give it five files, 10 files, a hundred thousand files, whatever it is. Um, or even just sort of partially compile one file and then link them all together later. Um, but C the language, like the text that you type into C doesn't really have uh, you know, much in the way of dealing with this concept other than sort of like header files and implementation files is, you know, sort of, you could, in terms of the language, maybe more like um, function prototypes and, and forward declarations and stuff like that um, are, are the manner in which C sort of tries to attempt this problem. Um, but as any anyone who's written sort of, uh, written in a large code base of C is probably where is it can end up being quite a bit of a headache and tricky to deal with at times. Um, but so most languages have built in, in most modern, somewhat modern languages have built in support for dealing with this idea of modularity and multi-file projects. Um, and yes, Dong is, Dong notes CMake in the chat as well. Um, so, Rust is no exception, and Rust doesn't really have a super unique take on this idea. Um, if you are familiar with how, um, you know, the, this idea of multi-file or modularity works in things like, things like Java, things like Python, things like, or even like the Java family, like Kotlin, um, even uh, uh, maybe Ruby to an extent, um, what are other, JavaScript also relatively close, although JavaScript has some weird quirks. Actually, JavaScript is pretty similar in terms of um, uh, the, oh, I forget the names for the different syntaxes. There's like the node syntax, which is the, uh, I think it's called the common JS syntax is what I'm looking for. Someone, JavaScript developer in chat can, can, um, can correct me. Uh, the one that's like import blah and export blah as opposed to module dot exports and and that sort of stuff. I think that's called common JS, but it's been, it's, it's been a, um, it's been an adequate amount of time since I've used JavaScript professionally. 
Um, I'm yeah, we'll we'll put it as that. Um, so when you talk about modularity in Rust, do you mean crates, structs, and infiltrates, etc., some specific stuff, or generally? So um, for the most part, I'm talking about the mod keyword and multi-file projects. Um, and it also encompasses ideas around uh, things like the use keyword as well. So why don't we just jump into some code? Um, I've thrown together in the leco 8 folder here um, just a, a small like library crate. So we know that crates sort of um, get defined in cargo tomals and stuff like that. This sort of overall thing, generally we think of a crate and a package <clears throat> as the same idea, ES6, awesome, thank you. Um, we think of a crate and a package as the same thing, but a cargo tomal at its highest level defines this idea of a package. A package can be comprised of multiple crates, um, uh, a crate being sort of like a single uh, compilable project kind of thing that you can imagine in Rust. Um, and it may be comprised of a package, may be comprised of many crates that eventually produce some kind of um, output, whether that's like a, you know, a, a uh, crate for a library, whether that ends up being some sort of binary file that you can run. But most of the time we've just had, and, and for the most part in Rust, you often just have um, like a single package here that describes a single crate with potentially many dependencies on other crates in the ecosystem. Um, and it has some sort of entry point. So most of the time we've been looking at source main.rs. Um, and again, you'll notice that we never specify source main here, or in our case here, source lib or anything like that. Um, this is a bit of a convention in the Rust community in that source main, if, if uh, cargo goes looking and it sees a source main.rs, then it's gonna go, great, this looks like a binary crate, a crate that should compile to some binary program that we can run. Um, and it's gonna require some sort of function main. Or if you're making a library for other people to um, to depend on and, and use sort of code that you've written, then you'll create a lib.rs instead and Cargo will go, great, I see that you've got a lib.rs there. I'm gonna build that into a library crate that other people can, can end up consuming. Um, you can also do both. And that's why I say, you know, a single package can refer to multiple crates. Um, so like if I had a main.rs here as well, then you know it's gonna complain, hey, you don't have a function main. Um, yep, let me get there. There we go. Um, now it's sort of this one package describes two crates. One's a library that other people can use. One's a binary that you can run to produce a, um, uh, that you can you know produce a, an executable out of and, and, and run or execute and that sort of stuff to have like a working program. Now, in um, Rust, libraries are more flexible than binaries. Um, in particular, there's a subset of things that you can't do with a binary that you can do on a library. Um, and libraries, if, if you write um, you know, a whole bunch of code to do a whole bunch of stuff, whatever that is, in a binary file, then it means that it's very hard for other people in the community to make use of the code that you've written. Um, you know, say like an open source community. Um, whereas if you write a whole bunch of your code in a library and then just create the smallest little binary crate that you can that uses your library to do whatever it is that you want it to do, then other people could use your library as a dependency um, and, uh, and, and make use of that. And you get more features that you can use that we'll talk about as time goes on during this lecture. So, this kind of split where you have two crates, a library crate and a main crate, when you're trying to create some sort of executable program is a relatively common and idiomatic split in the Rust community, just because it sort of allows you the flexibility of having um, a library that you get these extra features with that you can, um, that the rest of the community could potentially make use of. Or even if you're, a, let's say you're doing private development work for a, um, for a, a tech company that you're working for, you know, it may not be the greater open source community, but it means that other people at the company could make use of the code that you wrote as well if you did it in a library. Um, so you get that. And also you get a way to run your program to get the like terminal output that you wanted, let's say. So this kind of split is again, very common um, and something that you are welcome to make use of. Um, but 
uh, for now, like, okay, if you understand, okay, right, main.rs means we have some sort of binary crate, lib.rs means we have some sort of library. You can also define um, more uh, crates as well, oops, within this um, cargo.toml file here, you'll need to tell it where Rust should expect the base of that crate to be. Like, you know, source lib2.rs or source dot another main.rs, something like that. Um, and I honestly, I've forgotten the exact syntax for that, um, but you can go looking in the, in the Rust documentation and stuff like that to figure out if you wanna pull in multiple binaries or multiple libraries as well in it within a single package. Um, okay, so talking about modules, I think a lot of the time it's best sort of just explained by example. So you'll notice here that I have a public function called add to, takes an X, takes a Y and adds them together. Now this public function will get exported at the root of the crate. So my crate's name is lek08, right? So if I had another crate, um, in fact, if I had cargo, uh, cargo new, uh, uses lek08, uh, sure, and it can be a binary, let's say, uses lek08, like that. Uh, let's throw this over, actually, sure, we'll leave it here, that's probably fine. Uh, we'll hop back in here. Right, in this uh, new program here, I could say it depends on lek08, which has a path of uh, dot dot slash lek08, like that and cargo will go great i i can go looking for that and see that there's a crate there and cool you'll depend on it now and we can simply access this add to function you might just go well i can i know how to do that i'll say let uh sum equals add to and you see that rust analyzer suggests suggests this for you you hit enter you go add together 10 and 15 and oops and i'll print out that sum on the terminal and it just sort of does everything for you, 25, great. Life is amazing. Um, the one thing that we're sort of paying attention to in this lecture is this line that Rust Analyzer inserted automatically for us here, which says use lek08 add to. If you're familiar with a lot of other languages, you probably have seen this as import, import lek08 add to, for example. Um, and it's a very similar idea. It's basically saying bring this add to function into scope. Um, you wouldn't have to, you don't have to use a use if you don't want to, you could have written it like this as well, which just says inside the lek08 crate, give me the add to function and call that. But noting that if you didn't do either, we didn't do it like this and we didn't have the use statement, um, then this simply won't work. It doesn't know, uh, can't find the function add to because it's not in this current scope here. So you need to tell it where it comes from either with a use statement that brings it into scope or by specifying um, the path to get to this, this item here. Um, so that gives us add to, um, but you don't want to do all your work in just a single file, one would imagine. Um, you might want to split it up across multiple files or uh, very commonly as well into different folders as well, where we have, you know, uh, like this folder has a whole bunch of files, this folder has a whole bunch of files, this folder maybe has a whole bunch of folders, which in each of them have a whole bunch of files as well, sort of splitting up your project into logical little chunks. And again, this is what uh, Rust describes its module system as. So um, there's two, pro well, there's a few ways to sort of work inside a new module. The simplest of which is just defining a module in line like this where we just say, I'm gonna create a new module. I'll call it inline module in this case. And the the naming convention is usually lower snake case, um, as we've seen here. And this, anything in between these braces here is its own sort of separate sub module. Note it's a sub module of, the, of whatever we've got here. The thing we've got here is basically the root of the crate because we're in the lib.rs file. So we're in sort of like this module space lec08 in here and then we've just defined this inline module inside there so this is sort of like lek08 colon colon inline module right now and in fact i could even write that in here lek08 colon colon inline module like this and that's the module that we're we're looking at there um and i can define things in here so i can say function foo 
uh, that just says print lin foo, like that. And I've defined a sub function in here now. Now, something interesting is that in this program over here, let's go, let's say I wanted to use that function. I could say use leco8 inline module, uh, module foo. But we're going to get an error. It says module inline module is private, private module. Right, so if I do the, the big output here, it says module inline module is private, this one here, um, and it's defined like this. So uh, a lesson here that we've already run into, definitions are by default private in Rust. So if you're familiar with any other language that has this concept of like private, um, uh, or you know some languages have other visibility modifiers, like you might have protected in Java, um, or just like no visibility modifier might mean something else entirely. And often you have some sort of public or like export or whatever you want to call it. Rust has this idea of um, different visibility modifiers too. And they apply to any items that you might uh, define apart from macros. Macros are weird and we'll talk about that maybe in week seven. Um, but in this case, if I want this module to be accessible from, um, from an outside crate, I need to declare the module as being publicly visible with pub like this. Now note, that will solve this problem, but you'll notice that foo is still private. And so here again, I'll have to say that's uh, public. We go over here, it seems happy. I call the function and it prints out foo. Okay, so there's this idea of modules and there's this idea of uh, visibility modifiers and there's, there's this idea of importing with this use statement like this. Um, notice that the use statement, uh, there's some interesting things you can do with it. So for one, um, you can import something like this. This is essentially like shorthand for this. Import leco8 inline module foo as foo, right? It just takes whatever like the name of the thing is and imports it as that. But I could say import it as f instead if I wanted to. And instead of it bringing foo into scope, it brings f into scope and you could use it like that. So that's one thing you can do with use statements. Um, and you can also uh, like sort of see here, well, we have a use statement that is lec 8 add to and a use statement that's lec 8 inline module foo is f and see that these have in common, like they, they sort of have a common um, uh, prefix. So in this case, the common prefix being lec 8 colon colon. And you can sort of take advantage of that by throwing some braces here and saying inside lec 8 like use, lec 8 and inside lec 8 add to and inline module foo as f like this. And this is the same as having those two use statements separately and it still works just the same. Um, and you know, you can sort of format your imports uh, how you like as long as they don't get too ridiculous or anything like that. But this can sort of group things together uh, almost like semantically with these braces as opposed to just visually sort of scanning downwards. Um, it's, it's really up to your own preference if you use this or not. Some people choose to use it, some people choose to avoid it. I don't really, honestly, I don't really care, uh, you know, for such a small thing like this. Um, I might have missed this, but what's the main purpose of an inline module in Rust? Oh, that's a great, I, that's a great question. So um, an inline module is useful if you want to sort of um, like, how do I, this is, there's an interesting sort of idea here in that modules are one of those ab abstractions that if looked at in a certain way, do absolutely nothing, right? Like the fact that I've got all these modules split up and stuff like that, I could just take all this stuff and copy paste it into one big file and the program would be the exact same at the end of the day. Modules are really just about sort of like splitting up, um, splitting up different ideas. They do have a little bit of semantic meaning in the sense that um, they let you separate visibility. So um, if we were working in just this one file here, let's say I had two functions. Uh, so function one and function two, like this. No matter what visibility I specify, right? Pub, um, and there's, there's a couple more that we'll look at in a minute, or this default private, um, there is no way that I can separate function one from function two in the sense that like make it so they cannot call one another, right? Function one, oops, function one can call function two right now and function two can call 
I got that wrong twice, there we go. And function two can call function one. Maybe I don't want these to be able to see each other or call each other. And the only way I can realistically do that is with, um, is with a module, if I want it to be like, sort of looking like this. Um, but at the end of the day, they really don't actually do anything. Um, which is why there's, again, it's more of a, this is one of those things where it's not going to unlock some sort of superpower in programming for you, like something like the borrow checker might, where it's like, great, you can write this low level code using, and, and you know, take advantage of this full performance without a garbage collector or anything, and you don't have to worry about all that stuff. That's genuinely it sort of bringing something very, um, you know, potentially new and like special to you. The module system doesn't really do much like that. It's sort of just like a way that you can keep your thoughts organized as a programmer, right? You can say, this is all sort of relevant to this idea. That's all sort of relevant to that and split things up. Um, and in an inline modules case, you might have this sort of, um, you might have this small case where it's like, this is not really a big enough idea that I want to separate it out into a whole new file, but it's also not like entirely trivial. And there are a few things that could like reasonably be grouped together here um, into their own module. So I'm just going to declare an inline module like this. I'll throw them all in here. I won't bother making a new file. If it gets out of hand, then maybe I'll move it into its own file. Um, again, it's, it, it really is mostly a thing of, of kind of like taste. Um, so like putting them into two different scopes. Yeah, for sure. So modules also like they define their own scope. Um, so notice that if this function is not public function one and function two cannot call foo. Um, and so you're sort of separating out these different scopes, but the inline module you'll notice can still call, um, uh, oops, if I say like super function one like this. So notice we're inside the module here, but I can say in the um, super meaning the module above me, right? Above this inline module is the sort of big crate module call function one and it can still access everything from the parents like this, even if they're private, um, which is interesting. But yeah, separating scopes if you, if you would like to as well. Um, okay, so we can declare modules inline like this. Uh, we can also declare modules as their own file. So if I just write pubmod, some sort of name here, and then a semicolon, Rust will go looking for this thing here in the file system, whatever this thing's called. So in this one's case, we have one file module.rs right here. So it says, oh great, there's a file there, that will be the module. Um, or in the case of folder module here, it sees a folder with the name folder underscore module. Um, and it'll, in that case, it'll go to the folder and look for a file specifically called mod.rs inside it. It needs to be called exactly mod.rs in the case of a folder module, and that becomes the entry point. And you can define more modules in here and we'll look at folder modules later on in a second. Um, horrible Java flashbacks, no inheritance please. Yeah, so there's no inheritance system for, for modules, fortunately, but there is the idea of um, always being to access things in parent modules. Oh, I guess that is kind of inheritance, isn't it? But um, a very, very limited form of inheritance, I suppose. It's more like a tree than 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 uh, all the baggage that comes along with inheritance. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the one file module here. So one file module, great, uh, has some examples of the different visibility modifier visibility modifiers for us. Um, so it defines a sub module inside it. Um, and again, this is just like an inline module from the library function. It doesn't need to do this. It could, this could all just be inside um, the, the one file module module, if it wants to be. In fact, sure, let's change it so it does that. And uh, single file module uh, with, no, with no additional stuff in, in, inside of it. Um, and so let's look at some different visibility modifiers here. So uh, this one we already know, private functions. So if you don't give any visibility modifier, it's going to be a private function that cannot be called from outside this module or um, or this should really say any super modules, I believe is what I meant to write there. Um, so sub modules of this module here can still access the private function, um, but a like say this module here, the crate, the overall crate module here, 
will not be able to see this private function inside the one file module. Um, uh, another way of writing private is pub self. So this is how we sort of do like an in the middle visibility. We have private, which is just like nothing. We have totally public, which is pub. And then you can throw these parens in here to uh, modify the visibility. So it's like less, less than entirely public. So pub self is really saying um, it's public within this module, which if you've been following along public only within this module, it really just means private. Um, and so pub self is basically the exact same as being private. Um, we can also do, or let's say we'll skip to here for a second, pub super. So this is saying it's public within this module and my super module. So the super module being the module that sort of defined me, that brought me into scope. And so that would be the overall crate itself. Um, if we were like five modules deep, then it would be like the fourth module deep that would have access to it. Um, pub crate, meaning it's public from anywhere within this crate, but not from a separate crate, like say over here. So we have pub crate there. Um, and then there's this sort of more general one, which is pub in some path here. So I can write pub in crate colon colon one file module. So it's public only within the one file module. So this is just saying, oh, this was pub super because we had the sub module in here before, but the documentation is now potentially a little wrong. Um, but I could say, you know, pub in crate, pub in crate one file module. It, it, this, we don't have many options here since I got rid of that sub module here. Um, but anywhere along the ancestry tree, we, you can actually say with this syntax here, it's public like, if we're 10 modules deep, it's public from like the third module downwards, let's say, is, is something that you could write here. Um, or, you know, or you could just say it's public to just like two crates, two, sorry, two modules above me, but no further. Um, you know, it's, it's more generic here that you can use, you can throw a whole bunch of parts in there. Um, and so, yeah, Rust doesn't have some default visibility. The default visibility is private, and this is how you, there is, I guess you could write this as well, but I don't know if I've ever seen pub self in the wild. Um, it sort of just exists for, um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for here? It, it's it's it exists for sort of like uniformity. The fact that you can define sort of any visibility with pub and then um, like uh, some modifier after it. Um, but yeah, the default is pub self. The default being private essentially. Um, cool. And then if we go up to this folder module over here as well, um, you'll see again, if you have a folder module, you need to throw a mod.rs in there. And uh, inside this module, you can throw whatever you want. You could have functions in there. You could have uh, constants. You could have, uh, you know, static data. You could have structs. You could have enums. Um, you could throw implementation stuff, whatever. In any modules, you can basically throw anything mainly because all the stuff like everywhere, all the stuff you've written up to this point in this course has been in a module already. It's just been inside sort of the, the top level crate module. Um, but a very common thing for folder modules, usually use a folder module when you um, have like a whole bunch of stuff that's all gonna be loosely related, but going to be their own things. And so it's very common, very idiomatic for a, uh, a mod.rs, a folder module, to just like re-export stuff. So just to just go, there is a module called module A, there's a module called module B, there's a module called module C, and those just act as file modules in the context of this folder. So module A, module B, module C. And you can just bring them in like that. And another very common thing for, you know, libraries to do, for folder modules to do and all that is to re-export. So this is this pub use syntax, which is also new to us. Uh, it should be like completely new. You may have seen this before as, you know, Rust Analyzer was doing it for you automatically. Pub use is pro poss quite possibly completely new. Essentially what it says is bring this thing into scope here. So if we look in the, f in the module A, it defines a public function function from A and it just gives back the value 42. Um, and we say use function from A. So bring function from A into scope, but not only that, 
also like publicly export it from this module. Also publicly export it from this module. So what does that look like? It looks kind of like this, where um, lec08 folder module contains this function from A, function from B, and function from C. And then in uh, our other crate over here, I can say printlinbang, for example, lec08 folder module. Uh, it's not seeing for some reason. Function, oh no, I guess it is seeing it. It just wasn't suggesting it for some reason. Uh, foo became private. Did I do that? Inline module, lib. Oh, I did do that. My mistake. Okay, it's happy now. Um, right, so I can say lec08 folder module function from A, whereas previously I would have had to write folder module A function from A. So note that this works, right? There is um, the 42 in the middle here. But because this brings function from A into scope and then re-exports it, I can just access function from A from like straight within uh, the, the folder module here, right? And note that this, of course, doesn't need to just be functions. This can be any real item, to be honest. So this could be like some pub struct. Uh, let's say it's a pub struct foo, which has a x value as an i32. And on foo, we define a function foo that uh, has a shared bar of itself that just says print out foo has x equals self.x, like this. Um, so we define a struct called foo. And right now, if I wanted to use that, I would have to go let foo equals foo. And like Rust Analyzer is really going to struggle to find this right now. I'm, I'm probably going to have to go, or is it going to, okay, it sees it now. Let 8 folder module a foo like this. Uh, did it, why did I not import it? I clicked it. Foo. Foo. It thinks it, oh, it did, it did import it up here. That's a, uh, <laughs> Ross Allen is being very smart with the way I'm trying to format things clearly. Um, and give it, say, x is 42. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Fields as well inside structs um, can also have visibility modifiers on them. So I'm going to need to make this field publicly visible. And this, again, follows the same sort of rules of what you, you know, where this can be. Um, but I'm going to say the field is public just in this case to make this work. Um, and this comes from all the way in here. In fact, I'm going to leave the whole path here for demonstrative purposes like this. And then I can say foo dot, uh, right? This also needs to be public here. Foo dot foo, foo dot foo. Okay. Rust analyzer might be getting a little upset, but foo has X equals 42, as you can see here, this works. Right, as it comes from A and we sort of follow our whole path down there to A and note that everything is public along the way. Pub mod folder module, pub mod A, pub struct foo, pub X and pub function foo over here. So everything was public along the way. Um, but often like people using your library don't wanna go finding this whole path here. And so it's very common for say at the very top level of our library here, we might write something like right here, pub, oops, pub use folder module a foo, this struct over here. And so bring like bring foo here into scope in this module, but also re-export it out of this module as if I was the one defining it. And now magically we can just say, oops, sorry, not quite that far. Magically, we can just say lec awaits foo over here. Or if we were saying a, as a use statement, use lec08 foo like that, right? So pub uses a very nice and sort of powerful thing. Um, note that like, again, this is sort of weird. Sometimes you don't want people to be able to access your fields directly. This is a pretty common thing in uh, an idea around encapsulation, which is very common in object oriented languages. Um, you might say, no, I'm gonna make this field private, right? So then you can't instantiate this directly and instead you have to use some sort of constructing function that you write yourself that maybe looks like this. Uh, note that I can write foo here or I can use capital S self that just basically is an alias for the name foo. It's like they've just gone type self equals foo. Um, like that. 
And again, similarly, I can write foo here to create a new struct, or I can just write self here. X is, uh, let's take an X as an i32, and just include X in the struct there. And so this way, I can't instantiate foo like this. Maybe you want to force them to use your new constructor like that. And it still works. So um, a smart constructor, kind of. Um, you'll have to, you'll have to tell me what you mean exactly by smart, like what the smart, uh, means in, in this, uh, in this context, but it certainly is acting as a, as a constructor. Oh, from Haskell. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure I'm entirely familiar with the idea of smart constructors, um, in, in Haskell. Um, but speaking of, it's time for a break. So maybe I'll just quickly have a look at the wiki page and see if, uh, See if I, I'll go, it might click in my head and I'll go, oh yeah, I, I remember this, or if I just don't know it at all. Um, so let's take a quick break. That's most of the stuff to talk about, honestly, about modules, multi-files, um, and visibility and that sort of stuff. And then we're just going to talk about testing and uh, documentation after the break for the rest of the hour. And again, I think it should remain to be relatively chill. And a lot of the stuff, just to be clear, I don't be like, don't be afraid of, you know, of, of the stuff that we're learning here, be afraid of like messing it up and stuff, because although the compiler can be very mean, very mean is maybe is not the right way of putting it. It can be very persistent. Let's say the compiler can be, mm, you did that wrong. Mm, that's wrong. Mm, that's wrong. Eh, nope. That's wrong. Right. It might do a lot of that, but you know, it, you, it won't, it does its best to not let wrong code through. And so if you're having trouble with it, you know, just keep trying to iterate on it until the compiler stops yelling at you. You can ask us for help and um, help figuring out how that stuff works. But it's just something that you'll play around with and get used to over time. And again, if you're familiar with other languages, there's really not much special about Rust's module system. It's very typical and very standard. Um, there are some languages that have, um, that reserve the name like module system um, for somewhat different kinds of ideas. Um, in particular, the language that comes to mind for me is uh, the, like the ML family or um, potentially most popularly OCaml, um, where the idea of a module system is actually a very sort of, um, is, is a much more sort of serious and, and um, semantic idea, I suppose, than, than we, what, what we have here in Rust. And Rust doesn't go down that route in this particular case. It just follows what a whole bunch of other languages do in, in a rather simple sort of take on things and and nothing, not too much magic. Um, it's when you make a type, but you don't want to use a put in a valid data. So you make a specific constructor for the type or something along those lines. Okay, sure. Well, in that case, this is absolutely the same idea in that if you make all your fields public, then someone in a separate crate can feasibly construct or someone even in a separate module, let's say, can feasibly construct this foo with any value that they want. But let's say we only wanted to let them construct foos with values between zero and a hundred, let's say, um, then we could absolutely do something like the constructor returns an option of self where we say, um, if X is less than zero or X is greater than 100, then give them none. Otherwise, only then will we give them a value back like this. Um, and since they can't construct it themselves, they have to use this constructor that you've defined here. And there is no way a foo could be created with anything other than an X between uh, zero and a hundred. So if that kind of idea, absolutely, for sure. Um, you can bake those kinds of ideas into Rust. And this is a kind of thing that can also help you write far more robust code because you may be less likely to end up in a state that you may define as uh, like an illegal, some sort of illegal state or um, something that's going to cause your headaches. Um, so a pattern to, to certainly consider, especially for things like your assignment. So do with uh, data and variance. Yes, a very important concept in Rust, um, particularly around unsafe as well, um, which we'll talk about, I believe, week nine. Um, so we will absolutely talk about the idea of data invariance um, with a TS at the end instead of a CE. Um, and, uh, yes, a very, very big concept in Rust, especially on the advanced end of things. But even if you're defining your own sort of data here and you don't want X to have some kind of value, this kind of idea, like establishing an invariant on foo that X will, uh, be 
uh, between zero and 100, this can absolutely help you enforce that uh, at compile time, knowing that if your program compiles, it will have you know a correct value, let's say. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 past and we'll talk about the rest of the stuff. So enjoy your break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, let's get back into it. Um, so, the chat says, since Rust doesn't have function overloading, how do you make constructors that take in different arguments? That is a great question, um, and one that I'll answer by looking at, say, the standard library. So let's look at vec. Vec has a new function. Right, new. 
um, but also has different functions to construct a vec um, with different parameters. So for example, you can also specify a capacity when creating a, uh, a, a vec to say that, um, like I want you to, oh, <laughs> wow, look what's right underneath this one, I just realized. I was looking down here about to jump to it, but <laughs> it's right there. Um, create a new vector pre-allocating um, some specified capacity. And this is generally the pattern that uh, Rust programmers will take, is that they'll go, um, you know, they'll, they might have a new function like this or a with blah function that, you know, define some additional arguments. So yes, we just de generally call it different things, um, which is, it can be a, both a blessing and a curse. A curse in the sense of um, you end up maybe having to think of a different name for every different set of arguments, um, but a blessing in that you get sort of additional uh, inherent documentation in your program in that someone reading this will go, ah, then, you know, vec new of 42, I don't maybe know what that, maybe that 42 means that it's, um, you know, initializing with one value of 42. So the VEC has length one with the value 42. Maybe it means it's a capacity of 42. Maybe it means zero, 42 zeros or something like that. It could mean a whole different bunch of different things. Whereas with capacity of 42 sort of self documents that, yeah, this is initializing a vector with capacity 10. Um, and there is a, another common pattern in Rust where if you if you end up with the um, what do people call this um, Java Java telescoping constructor this this sort of pattern of telescoping constructors in Java um, hopefully this yes this is there we go so this is a very common thing to see in Java code bases in particular um, that I am I'm certainly guilty of over the last decade um, in that you'll have a constructor for this class here, dirty person. I don't know why it's a dirty person in this blog post, but that's all right. Um, where they just define a, a first name and a last name, or you can do an age, or you can do a profession, uh, you can also give a profession or a list of string that are your, your hobbies. I'm assuming they probably give you another example, right? Where they say each constructor sort of just passes on to the next one with, um, with some like default values along the way. Um, that's what this like this syntax is is like pass it on to the next one the next one the next one um, and again the sort of this is a this is a relatively common pattern in Java in rust if it gets to this point where you're getting all these sorts of different things that might need to be initialized um, we generally palm that off to the builder pattern um, the builder pattern is very common in rust um, I'm sure you can probably just search rust builder pattern and find examples on Sure, yeah, style, ownership, builders, and it shows you a, a common way of creating a builder in Rust to achieve a similar idea. With the nice benefit, of course, being that um, uh, unlike this example here, when you're creating a new person, you know, it might not be obvious to you which parameter means what, right? Arrays.as list phishing here, it's not 100% clear that this is hobbies, right? This could be like skills, or this could be professional, whatever. Whereas in a builder pattern, you end up like really typing out what each individual thing is. Um, so for example, here dot named thread to dot stood out, blah, dot whatever. And it short, so you sort of like self document this here is an argument or this here is something else along the way as well. And you get the same sort of, same sort of idea. Um, oh yeah, good question. So, oh yeah, if you're interested in like more stuff about modules, by the way, chapter seven of the Rust book here, managing growing projects with packages, crates, and modules is a nice chapter to read in your own time as well. Um, we're now going to talk about testing in particular. Um, well, for now, we'll just start off with unit testing. Um, and again, there's really not much to add in terms of unit testing for this course. If you're not familiar with unit testing, like what unit testing is, what is unit testing is probably a good Google query to get you started. Um, but the basic idea is, um, oh, to all our readers in Australia, go away. I'm kidding, I, I love Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> unit testing is a method by which individual units of source code um, are tested together 
are tested to determine whether they are fit for use. There you go. So basically, does this function do the right thing is what it is a lot of the time, or does this struct act in the right way or something like that. So I've got an example of a unit test here, or three unit tests here. Um, test one, test two, and test three. And they just say, if I call add two with two and three, is it equal to five? Five and 10, is it 15? Four and 40 and two, is it 42? Right? Um, now the thing that makes this a test, that notice that this is defined in line with all the other code. This is, uh, I believe some language, languages act like this, but a lot of languages you have a completely separate source and tests directory. Um, so you have your source folder with all the source code and your test folder that sort of mimics the structure, but with um, uh, but with uh, only like unit tests in that separate thing. In particular, Java is a language. In fact, that's a really big reason as to why Java has like the the default visibility is this like package local idea, and it's almost like a hack. So this testing the testing idea can actually work in in a certain sense. Um, in Rust. It can all just get sort of thrown in together in the same place. Um, and the thing that makes something a test is throwing this test attribute on it. So it's just a hash, a square bracket, the word test, and then a closing square bracket. The next function that is defined, i.e. this function right here, is now a unit test that can be executed. If I click run test, you'll see VS Code will go ahead and run this test for me. Um, generally, we'll use cargo test. I'll write cargo test lib to test all my to do all my unit tests. And it says test one is okay, test two is okay, and test three is okay. Note that if one of these functions was incorrect, if I said test at five and ten add up to sixteen instead, we would get test two failed. It says test test two failed. Uh, panic that assertion failed. Left is equal to right. Left was fifteen, right? This one here. Left hand side was fifteen. The right hand side was sixteen. On, in this file on this line here, right? So it points you to the right spot. It tells you what the values were and all that. Um, and in this case, the test failed because I just modified it to make it fail. I run it again and now my tests are passing. So unit tests are a nice way to help you write cases to try and ascertain whether your code is working correctly. Um, there is a beautiful quote um, and you know I love my quotes. Here we go. In, in fact, in the Rust book on the writing automated tests chapter, chapter 11. In his 1972 essay, The Humble Programmer, Edger Dijkstra, right? Edger Dijkstra, who made a quick feature in lecture one, said that program testing can be a very effective way to show the presence of bugs, but it is hopelessly inadequate for showing their absence. The Rust book notes, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to test as much as we can. So, um, uh, again, this is one of those things, I think, did I just close it? Yes, I did. Um, this is one of those things where, oh, add two. Is that what I called it as well? That's funny. <laughs> like, I, I sound like I'm being sarcastic, but that's actually a funny coincidence. Um, so uh, again, a thing in Rust, there's nothing particularly special in Rust as far as I'm concerned in terms of what's different, what differentiates Rust's unit tests to unit tests in other languages. If you've done testing in any other language, you know, in Python, in JavaScript, in Java, in, you know, whatever it is in C++, um, you know, it's the overall, the overarching idea of unit testing is still very similar. The primary differences in Rust is that we generally just include our unit tests alongside the source code. It's very common to just throw these tests at the bottom of the file. Right, whatever file we're in, uh, or I guess at the bottom of the module, considering that a file now, we now know that a file sort of acts like a module itself. At the bottom of the module, we just throw a whole bunch of unit tests. Um, and um, yeah, we, we expect you to do some testing and stuff like that in some weekly exercises in the assignments to try and, you know, try and prove an absence of some amount of bugs to try and just give you like a baseline. Does it look like it's working correctly or maybe to test out some edge cases, stuff like that. Um, and, it, and really there's, the way I should be saying this is that there's, I don't feel like there's much I can talk about in this lecture here in terms of unit testing in general that you wouldn't be able to get better information out of, you know, just Googling around on the internet. 
I don't really have much, much special in terms of testing. There are some people who I'm sure are incredibly smart and have spent a really long time thinking about uh, unit testing and, and all that. I'm not really here to be that person, but I will show you at least how to do it in Rust. Um, there is one other idea that people commonly do, which is to stop these test functions from cluttering up all this other code here. It's very common to throw them in a submodule and you often just call that submodule tests, right? So we throw all of these tests here in a little submodule called tests. You'll notice that since we're in a submodule, it doesn't know what add to is anymore. So we might need to say use super, meaning the module that I am inside, uh, use super add to, or a very common thing for mod tests as well is say use super star, which just means bring everything in the above crate into scope because that's what we're testing at the end of the day anyway. So this is very common to see in a, specifically in a, um, in a tests module. And then one last little thing that we can do as well, um, it takes Rust some amount of time to compile this code. And sometimes we're just saying like cargo build, right? Build my code, which doesn't include say cargo test, go ahead and test my code. Um, and cargo build is still gonna go and build all this stuff. Um, uh, it's gonna build all this code, even though it really has no need to, unless we're testing. So you can throw a little attribute on, on top of this whole module that says, only consider this module if we are running tests, right? Only like bother to compile this code inside here if you're running unit tests. And the way we say that is another attribute, similar to how we use this test attribute down here. Another attribute that just says CFG config um, test. So config essentially says only include the, the item that comes below this, the item that comes below this being the module tests, only include this code here if, and then inside here, there is a lot of different things you could write. You can say like the target OS is Unix, for example. So like only build this code on a Unix platform or like on a Windows platform or something like that. Um, you know, there's, there's, all, there's a whole bunch of different things you can put in here. Um, but test means only build this code here if you are running uh, unit tests. And you'll see, yep, it still has that. And building will be ever so slightly faster um, because it's it doesn't need to end up building this code here, which is kind of nice. So what we've got here is basically its final form. This is incredibly common for testing in Rust. Um, and you'll see it in like basically any popular crate, you'll see these little things peppered at the bottom of basically every module. Um, just, you know, just for some amount of unit tests. Um, Rust also does support integration tests. Um, uh, integration tests sort of being like tests that don't just test one small thing individually, say one small function, but test everything together as a whole. Um, and I believe you can just throw these in a, oops, you can throw these in a folder called tests and you can just make any file you want here. Like my, oops, my, test.rs that just says like test uh, function my test um, use lec08 add to add to of uh, 5 and 10 and assert that that's equal to 15 let's say and um, oops let's go cargo test, it doesn't like, uh, this is something completely different, I believe. Uh, over here, there we go. Test my test, uh, which is this one here, passed. If I give it something different, 16, we should see that this integration test here, uh, 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 here has failed. My test failed with, you know, 15 is not equal to 16. Um, so that's, that's kind of handy. I notice I'm running it as cargo test. Uh, instead of cargo test lib, which is just running the, the unit test as opposed to integration test as well. I could also write, I believe, uh, no, test. Uh, oh no, that was right, sorry, test my test was right. So I can also tell it just run this integration test in particular if I wanted to. Um, but we'll fix that and then leave it be. Nice, it's okay, it's happy. So you can test sort of the public API surface. This is almost like these integration tests also essentially act as a completely separate crate. 
which is very handy if you want to sort of test as if you were an external user using your using your library, you know, as a, as a completely separate thing and make sure that your whole API surface is working as intended. So integration tests can also be kind of handy as well. Um, and they just get thrown in like this, this tests folder. Um, cool, was there anything else that I wanted to mention? Something popped into my head? Yes, one other thing did pop into my head. Um, let's say add to, this seems like an absolutely insane requirement, but let's say add to said that um, X and Y must be like, uh, must not be negative. I don't know. Um, and if they are negative, it panics. Let's say that's like genuinely what you wanted your function to do. Again, it seems like a pretty crazy thing to want your function to do, but let's say like, uh, uh, let's say we wrote um, this, uh, you know, warning, this function will panic if X or uh, Y are less than zero. And in the code we wrote, if X is less than zero or Y is less than zero, panic saying, oops, panic saying up X and Y must not be negative. Right, so again, an absolutely bizarre idea for a function, but let's say you wanted to test that this function should panic. That's a little tricky, because if I wanted to write a test for this, function, I don't know, I'm just gonna call it test four. These are not good unit test names either, keep in mind. Um, like what do I write here? Let's say if I wanna test where X is negative one and Y is 50, like it shouldn't be 49, it should be like, I don't know, panics, you know, something like that. So maybe I don't know what to put here. Let's just say 49. You'll see that this test will fail simply because it panicked, right? The test failed because it panicked. Um, now the way that you tell a unit test, this test, if it panics, it passes. Like this test is supposed to panic. If it doesn't panic, then throw an error is with another attribute that just says should panic like that. And you'll see now, great. It uh, should panic. It did panic, therefore the test passed. If it didn't panic, if I got rid of this negative one here now, you'll see that it's Okay, right, that's funny, because 50 plus one is 51, which is not equal to 49, which panics assert eek. Um, if I make it not panic, it then fails because it did not panic. So should panic is um, useful, but you've got to be, you know, you wanna be careful with it as well. Because as you can see, it just made something that was doing the wrong thing look like it was doing the right thing for me just then. Um, so just be a little careful when you're using it, but sometimes you do want to test that something should panic and this is how you would do that. Okay, so that's our unit testing. Um, cool, so I've got documentation and documentation testing left over. Does anyone have any questions up to here? Oh, actually there are some things. I just like have missed the chat for a while. Um, but if you have more questions, keep asking them while I read up. Um, I just realized this structure makes testing private functions trivial. Yes. So there, in fact, I think the book even notes um, test organization. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, ep, 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 uh, there we go. There's debate within the testing community about whether or not private functions should be tested directly and other languages make it difficult or impossible to test private functions. So this is, this is a very common idea. And often if you like really want to test private functions, you need to do some like horrible ha hacks in other languages to make it work. Regardless of which testing ide ideology you adhere to, Rust's privacy rules do allow you to test private functions. So like if you think that private functions absolutely should not be tested, then you can just not do that. Um, but if you would like to test your private functions, you do have that option available to you. So it's your choice. Um, and Java, I just gave up and either copy pasted a private function into a test file or made the private function public. And yes, that's also why Java has that package private default specifier. A very big reason for that is to is for this testing hack. Um, are there any Rust assertion libraries? Stdlib seems not to have many. Um, and library suggestions for mocking stuff. Um, so in terms of the standard library, uh, let's go. Uh, assert. So it spits out a whole bunch of like random macros here, but it's mainly just assert, meaning like assert this is true, 
assert eek, as, you know, assert the two expressions that are equal to one another, assert not eek with any. Um, and I don't think there's much more than that. Um, there's like debug asserts that you can, that aren't intended to be used in unit tests. They're just sort of intended to be sprinkled throughout normal code. Um, in terms of crate suggestions for assertions, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know there is absolutely some good crates for mocking, um, uh, assert, let's see. This, this seems like a lot of downloads. That seems like a lot of downloads, but it hasn't been up. It hasn't been updated in a few years. Um, yeah, what if we just go sort by downloads or sort by recent downloads? Um, yeah, assert potentially this one, assert. Nope. There is really not much in here. Is there, uh, what about this one? Spectral influenced by Google truth. Well, that sounds, that sounds promising. Um, assert that subject starts with, yeah. Okay. So this sort of has that sort of Google truth feel that, um, sort of like a JavaScript jest feel to it a little bit. Um, there might be some good crates out there. If you find some that you particularly like, then, uh, let us know in the course forum. Um, but none that I'm like super familiar with personally. Um, but they're probably out there. Um, and then in terms of mocking, um, gratuitously, gratuitously unsafe mocks. So the, I was thinking of mock all personally, um, but that one comes up first, I think just because it's got, uh, uh, it's got, uh, the exact name that I searched for. Um, but mock all, I believe is the, uh, is the most popular one. If you would like to do mocking. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I won't go too deeply into this now because mocking is also a little bit too advanced for where I want to go with the lectures today. Um, but it is definitely a, an option for sure. Um, and yeah, mock all is generally what people, people reach for. Um, and the command to run tests again, no problem at all. So there's a couple we have, the easiest one is cargo, oops, cargo test or on CSE 6991 cargo test. Um, and that just means run all the tests, run unit tests, run integration tests, run documentation tests, just run it all. And you're gonna see there's some tests that are, that are failing right now because I messed with the paths earlier. If you just wanna test your unit tests, then dash dash lib is what you're looking for. Just give me the unit tests. If you want to test a particular integration test, then you would say test and then the name of the integration test. So in my case, I have this test here called my underscore test and that will just run the integration test. Um, and we're also going to look at documentation tests in a minute that you will test with dash dash doc. And that just runs documentation tests, one of which is failing right now. Um, but cargo test is the overarching command, cargo test. Um, cool. Uh, missed the first test. Uh, do you mean you missed the first command that we ran, which was just, I think just cargo test. Otherwise, yeah, cargo test lib or dash dash lib uh, dash dash test with a unit with an integration test or dash dash doc for documentation tests. All right. So last little bit of this lecture then is rust doc and documentation tests. Um, documentation tests will come pretty easily, uh, at the end because we've sort of, we'll have covered everything around it. Um, documentation is an absolute like, form of art. Writing good technical documentation is a skill that probably takes decades to master. Um, it, it's, but like, you know, when someone's like, when someone is good at writing tech, technical documentation, it really, uh, it does a lot for, for people who are trying to use that code. So if we look at say, um, the VEC, the VEC type here, and let's say we look at insert or something like that. We'll see that the function comes along with some documentation. It says inserts an element at position index within the vector, shifting all elements after it to the right. Um, it says it panics if the, the index you provided is greater than the length of the vector. And it also comes along with this little code example here that you can also run. So it says let mute vec is a vec of one, two, three. Insert at index one, four. So we have one, four, uh, one, four, two, three. And insert in the next four, fives, so we have one, four, two, three, five. Now, here's something really important to notice. 
Do you notice that this example is written as a unit test? Right? Like see this assert eek, assert eek. Now this is like, there's obviously a little bit of fluff that comes along with writing it this way. But for the most part, you can sort of read it top to bottom and go, okay, I understand what this example is. Like this is an example of code to me and I can run this here. It'll take it to the Rust playground and I hit run and it works, right? Or if I want to go, okay, actually I want to like, I really want to see what the VEC looks like um, right here. And when I run it, I could print it out and go, oh, okay, it, it really is like that or something like that. Something that's really interesting about Rust is that this example is tested. So that's one really cool thing. Have you, like, you? this is a kind of thing that you may run into like very infrequently is you run into a case where someone has written documentation, they've provided you an example and the example is like just wrong. Like the example doesn't work, the example doesn't compile, the example does the wrong thing. Um, you don't have to worry about that with Rust documentation because this acts as a unit test. So how did they make their documentation look like this? Let's just look at the source code and it'll show us. So notice above where they've defined the insert function here, and by the way, this is what the insert function looks like, fun fact. Um, if you look above it, you'll see these triple slashes. So you'll recall in Rust, you can define a comment with a double slash, but if you do a third slash, it doesn't actually change anything. It's still just a comment. In fact, it's more like a comment that starts with a slash. Um, but tools like Rust doc, you know, Rust doc in particular, will look for comments that are slash slash slash, or also slash slash exclamation point and um, treat them specially. So in this case, if you do a triple slash, it means this is documentation for the, the item that comes next, right? The item that comes next being this function insert here. Um, and then, you know, after these triple slashes, you can just put markdown, right? If you're familiar with markdown format, like .md, um, you can just put markdown basically. Um, and if you like don't know what Markdown is, there's a lot of like really quick sort of cheat sheets on learning, you know, how Markdown works. Just Google Markdown and find the first um, the first uh, guide that you know feels like it fits for you. That you're like, yep, you know, even like a cheat sheet is particularly handy. Like headings look like this, uh, bold text, italic text, quotes, lists, unordered lists, you know, inline code, URLs. You know, it, it's a very simple syntax, to be honest. Uh, if you're having trouble with Markdown, you can always ask on the, the course forum at any point. Um, but uh, you can just basically put Markdown. Where were we? We were here. Um, and that's what they've done here. They've written some text. Notice here's some inline code index. And that index sort of gets highlighted as code there because it's referring to this um, argument here. Um, a whole bunch of text. Notice that they have a line break after the word all, shifting all line break elements after to the right, shifting all, notice there's no line break here. In Markdown, if you want a line break, you need to sort of do two new lines. Because of that, I'd strongly suggest, um, you know, inserting new lines as the line is getting relatively long because it won't make your documentation look weird. Um, if you really want a separate line, then you'll just need to do you know, new line, new line. Um, so yeah, it means your documentation doesn't end up drifting way out to the right if, uh, you know, if that was going to be a problem. They have a heading here for panics, all right, which is this one here. Panics if, and then code here, index is greater than len, all right? And then examples, they do a code block, which they denote with triple ticks here, triple tick. And that creates this code block here. And without doing anything else, without writing anything else, this, they have created a documentation test. And when you run cargo test or cargo test dash dash doc, it will test that this example both compiles and um, like works correctly if it, in the case of this unit test here, when you run cargo test, which is just awesome. Like I think it's a really cool feature. I think, um, I think this was primarily inspired from Python, I believe. Um, and just like, what a, what a great idea. What a, what a brilliant idea, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah. And this documentation will get generated and thrown into sort of a page that looks a little bit like this. Um, and let's see how we can do that for our code here.
So here's our library. Notice that I've put in some doc some uh, documentation around the place, right? Um, in some other functions like the one file module, you'll see that I put in uh, some documentation all over the place here. I also have used this slash slash bang syntax here. Slash slash bang basically means, you know, this is a module. Yeah, this is gonna be like an English essay here where I just say the same thing a bunch of times. This is a, a module defined in a single file. This single file comprises the module in its totality. Please enjoy this single file module at your leisure. Great. Um, so this slash slash bang syntax here basically means don't document the thing that comes next, right? See this triple slash meaning document the thing that comes right after these comments here. Slash slash bang means document the thing I am in. So in this case, it's inside this one file module right here. So it means document um, the document the module itself, one file module. Um, you know, up here, when we're in sort of the crate module at the very top here, I could also throw documentation that goes, uh, you know, lec08 crate. This is a crate that is used to demonstrate modules, testing, and visibility. Is there another thing in there? Modules, testing, visibility, whatever, that sounds about right. Um, and this will document sort of like the overall crate itself because it's defined in the crate. Um, notice you could, for example, take this documentation here, right, which is documenting the thing that comes next, throw it inside the function, uh, but with exclamation points instead to say, document the thing I am inside. This is very rare to see in the wild. Most people only use uh, double slash bang to mean at the like top of a file to mean document this module and um, the triple slash syntax, uh, the triple slash syntax to mean like document this item, this function or whatever, um, because it's the thing that comes next. Very rarely will you see something like this inside of a function, which is something that you might see in Python where people just sort of like define a string that like is their documentation, which always felt, felt a little strange to me, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so this is not so idiomatic, but you can do it that way. Yes, regardless, so I'll leave it there. And if you want to see the documentation for your crate, you simply go cargo doc, and it's built the documentation. If we look inside target, you'll see that there is a new folder in target now called doc. Inside target doc, there's a whole bunch of like JavaScript and CSS and all that. But if you see here, lec08 is the name of our crate. And if we look inside there, there is an index.html index.html. So if you open this file in your browser, which I'll do like this, it's put it on the wrong window. I'll bring it back over here. You'll see it just opens up this path here. YouTube is not receiving enough video. Yes, you are, you liar. Um, uh, you see it's opened up this file here, index.html, and it looks like uh, Rust crate documentation. You have S to search and all that, and it you know does the right thing. I can search for foo and I get all these different things. Um, so it acts like anything else. And you can see our documentation has popped up over here now. Uh, internet broke, oh, all good now. Okay, so YouTube, maybe YouTube was right. <laughs> okay, maybe YouTube was right. Just to uh, recap what I was saying, um, I opened this file in my browser. This index.html is target doc lec08 index.html. Open that up in my browser, which is this file here. And there's my documentation. Um, so crate lec08, you'll see lec08 crate here. That's this heading that I defined here. This is a crate that is used to demonstrate modules testing and visibility. That's this all here. Notice it says it re-exports module folder a foo. That's the documentation. It has some modules, folder module, inline module, and one file module, and add two. Notice add two has this warning, this functional panic if x or y are less than zero. Okay, that's nice. Um, the one file module, this is a module defined in a single file. This single file comprises the module in its totality. Please enjoy this single file module at your leisure. Uh, that would be this one here. And you'll notice this private stuff doesn't end up appearing in the documentation um, because uh, you're not able to access it, sadly, from outside the crate. 
Um, I believe there is a way to get Rust doc to build documentation with um, private things. Um, is do we get to see it in here? No, I don't think so. Um, but I, I honestly, I can't quite remember the incantation to do that. Um, uh, but I, I'm sure you could find it if you if you really needed it. But we see the public function here, and it says it, this is a truly public function. This function could be called from anywhere within this crate or not. Great news for API consumers as they can use this. You'll definitely want some good documentation to go along with it, as well as a documentation test. So you can see I wrote all of this over here, and then I wrote a documentation test. So note that over here we say we see let my number equals public function, right? Calling the function here and assert that it's equal to 42. I actually needed one more line of code to make that work, which was this use statement, like bring the public function into scope with this big path here. But I don't want this to show up in my example. I, I figure that someone who knows how to write Rust knows how to import this function when they need it. So I don't want it to clutter my documentation. And I can tell the code, you know, the doc test to include this line of code when you're testing it, but not to actually um, include it in the overall documentation by putting a hash symbol, just like this. Um, notice I got rid of that sub module before. So if I go cargo test doc, this documentation test here is failing because it goes, I don't know what sub module is, right? You can see it's really like running it through the Rust compiler. So if I get rid of this, oops, this sub module here, and then test it, you'll see the documentation tests all pass, which is brilliant. Um, I have another one, folder module, folder module mod RS. Uh, our, oh, let's, let's look at the documentation for this. I've written something apparently. Folder module, a folder module. Folder modules must contain a file named mod.rs that acts as the entry point for the overall module. It is very idiomatic for mod.rs files to simply re-export sub-module contents. As such, we will do that in this module, right? So you can see this is the stuff in the module. We can also put doc tests here too. So in the overall module documentation, I also threw in a random test here that just tests uh, the individual functions further down. This is this is not so idiomatic. Um, I mean, I actually, it's it is actually useful when you want to just show a quick example of using your crate overall. Um, like I wonder if say the rand crate does that. Yes, it does. So the rand crate in the overall you know documentation, and we can look at the source code for this as well. Right, so this is their lib.rs, right? Maybe it makes more sense if I go to their GitHub page and show you in their source, this is the rand crate to generate random numbers and go lib.rs. You'll see at the very top here, it says they've got this documentation um, and they show here's a quick start. If you just, to get you started quickly, the easiest and highest level way to get a random value is to use the random function or you can use thread RNG. Here's a quick example that shows you. And as we know, uh, this example is tested. They have not written this example as a unit test because it's more of a, a quick start thing. They just want to show you like how to quickly use the thing as a like it's not going to be so useful if you copy paste it and it's like a, a unit test. Um, but uh, it is, uh, it, it will at least like the test will make sure it compiles, make sure it builds, which is at least something. Um, and um, let's see. And I wonder if they end up having any code in here that gets not used. No, they don't comment any of the code out, which is interesting. They, I suppose they don't really need to for a, for this sort of top level thing. Um, anyway, where were we? We were here, we saw this This will get run as a doc test. We see it re-exports these sub-modules and we can access uh, the modules from within. And so as I noted here, you can also document a module here if you wanted to, but generally people tend to document the module Usually, oops, usually we document it up here though, like that. And you'll see that all this documentation ends up getting pulled through because we documented half of it as like a next item kind of documentation and half of it as a, you know, the thing I'm inside kind of documentation with these two different syntaxes. Um, Okay, so an H1 in the code block is ignored. Well, a code block doesn't really have an H1, if that makes sense. Um, the, like, where have I got some good documentation? Here. So, like, an H1 makes sense in terms of markdown, which when you're, like, just writing normal text in a doc in documentation, it'll be interpreted as markdown. 
Um, but if you open a code block, then you're no longer in Markdown. You're writing Rust code now. Um, you can also do other languages, like if you wanted to do C or if you wanted to do like Python, you might have to write all of Python out, I can't quite remember, um, if you wanted to. And then you'll notice that when I do this, it doesn't get interpreted as a doc test anymore. See, watch at the top here, run doc test. I say it's Python code and now it goes away. Um, if I do Rust though, then the doc run doc test will remain, will stay. Um, so this isn't really, there's, there's no way, this is not markdown syntax anymore. Until the code block ends, this is code at this point. So the hash has no semantic meaning uh, until they decided that a hash will mean include this line of code, but don't don't make that code uh, that line of code appear in the actual documentation itself. Um, cool. So documentation tests are awesome. When you're documenting code, I strongly suggest them, and we strongly suggest them in uh, in some exercises and your assignment uh, code in your assignment for sure. Um, and yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, I wonder if there's anything else that the um, that some of these other very popular crates, including here, Surdy, um, which we've used a little bit, an awesome framework for serializing and deserializing uh, Rust. Uh, we can look at how they've written documentation in their code. Uh, Surdy source lib.rs, and you'll see again they've written it. Um, they've actually used a, an unordered list here as well with um, with uh, URLs in them. And you can see they've done it like this. They've gone JSON, postcard, Seaboard, YAML, whatever, with these square brackets. And then they define those URLs down the bottom here, which is also quite nice. Um, oh, another actually quite awesome thing to do um, in your documentation is you can link across them as a uh, link for, to different things as well. Like let's say in, um, let's say in this add to function, we wanted to say like, uh, you know, some notice that says uh, this function is, uh, how, what's, a, what's a good thing to go for? Like, hmm. Maybe we're saying uh, like this function uh, is useful if used alongside the, the foo type, right? So stage one is it like, imagine I just wrote it like this. If I look at the, doc the documentation now um, for this function, it says this function is useful if used along the foo type here, right? I can improve this a little bit though by putting foo in back ticks like that. Uh, I have to rebuild the documentation, of course. And now it sort of shows us code, but I can go one step further. If I wrap this in square brackets like this, and then uh, do that, you'll notice it goes orange and it becomes clickable. And if I click it, it takes me to the struct foo with like, you know, foos functions and all that. Um, so if you mention another type in your program, like in your documentation, I would strongly suggest using this syntax, the square brackets meaning, generally meaning like some sort of URL, but then with the back ticks inside here saying this is, um, this is like a, a piece of code that we're linking to another type in our program or another item uh, in our program. This is a great thing to do because it lets readers of your documentation just like click straight to it and then see all the stuff over there. So um, strongly suggest that. Um, cool. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about? Um, there's the Rust doc book is pretty handy. Um, you can just search for the Rust doc book, I suppose. The Rust doc book and it's yep, the first result here. Um, if you're ever confused on um, using uh, Rust doc or anything like that, you can just find, uh, you can find this, this uh, Rust doc book here and, and it'll have most of the information you need. For example, we were just talking about linking to items by name. Uh, and we used this syntax over here, but there's also different syntaxes you can use as well. Um, and um, yeah, um, if it's if there if you need some sort of like path to things as well, then you can write it. Uh, you can you can use this as well kind of syntax, and it'll link correctly. Um, yeah, not too much to it. I don't think there's anything else I really wanted to talk about. Um, so any questions, I suppose, and we'll like not have to go overtime this week.
which is pretty epic. Oh, something I did forget to mention earlier. I think submissions for a couple things are broken right now. In particular, I believe the um, assignment expects you to submit two crates. And I think in this week's weekly exercises, um, I want to say modularity. Oh, here we go. Great warning. Submission for this exercise is not currently on. This is another exercise that it expects you to submit two crates. Um, 699 on give is, is not prepared to deal with submitting multiple crates at a time. And so uh, the submissions don't work just yet, but I believe um, Shrey or Tom are, uh, are looking into this. Um, how much documentation are we expected to write for the assignment? That's a great question. Um, let's see. So here we go. So that would probably fall under idiomatic design here, which is again, one of the big components of, um, of the uh, assignment, 45%. And in here it says documentation where provided is correct and readable. Um, there should probably be there should probably be a um, another dot point here that says uh, documentation is is uh, is provide like a you know a lot a, a very reasonable amount of documentation is provided. I hope it's mentioned in this part two here at some point. Um, let's see, blah 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 blah. Doc. Here we go. While you must make sure you implement these features, you do not need to implement tests to write significant documentation. So this is part one here that they're talking about. Oops. So part one, you don't need to write a whole bunch of documentation yourself. There we go. You will also need to provide documentation where appropriate in terms of part two. Is it mentioned again? Ah, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Um, great. So it's not only as a part of idiomatic design, but also this mechanical style for quests. You must have tests, which encompasses the three tests. You must have all public interfaces document. So any public type that could be visible to an external user must be documented. And then, so like the mechanical style is it must be documented. And if it is documented, then you'll sort of, you know, get some marks. Um, and then your documentation itself is assessed under idiomatic design here. So this is like you documented it at least like a little bit. If you just put a doc comment that had nothing in it, then we will take the marks away from you. Um, but if you if you document it, if you like at least made a reasonable attempt, you'll get the mechanical marks. Um, but then we also sort of assess the manner in which you wrote your documentation and if it's um, correct and readable and and you know uses stuff like documentation tests and um, and uh, is generally just nice to use documentation, then you'll get the marks over here as well. Um, so, and a, a very good suggestion here is this one missing docs. Let me show you that. Um, so notice at the top here, I've got this little attribute. The hash bang here is essentially saying, um, similar to like this here. In this case, it's saying apply this attribute across the whole crate. Um, so not just like one item or one module or whatever, make the whole crate here um, uh, like allow unused items. Like I'm just using this to basically silence warnings that are like here, like this function is never used. That function is never used. This function is never used. And I'm turning this on so we don't get so much noise in the lecture just by it complaining, Hey, you didn't use this by the way, which is honestly just more annoying than anything. Um, something that I would very strongly suggest you turn on is, um, warn on missing doc. So anything, any sort of publicly accessible item that's missing documentation, you'll get a warning when you build your code. So maybe you don't need to do this like right at the beginning because it might just be annoying to you if you're not writing documentation as you go. You might find that writing documentation as you go actually helps you. Um, but if you choose not to, it might end up being annoying. So maybe you just do this at the end, but this will show you every, oops, every single thing that could be publicly accessible that is missing documentation which is really handy. You could also change this one to deny, and then it will literally not let you build your code until you write your documentation, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, warn on missing docs is, is very common um, to sort of help you through. And then even in some big libraries, in fact, let's check Rand and Surdy 
Um, sometimes they'll even do deny missing docs. See, look at this. In the this is a, one of the most popular crates in the whole Rust ecosystem. The RAND, uh, RAND denies missing docs, so that if someone tries to like make a pull request and goes, "Hey, I added something," um, and then it runs through uh, 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 CI, right? It runs through continuous integration. You know, makes sure that the code they're adding isn't breaking stuff, but they didn't document it. Then it'll go, nope, we won't merge this in. We won't even look at it because um, you know you didn't document your stuff. So this is something very common once the crate is entirely documented. Once you've documented everything, then you might want to consider turning on deny missing docs um, as well, especially if it's a big project. Certy, let's see if Certy did it as well. I'm just sort of interested at this point. Um, allow all this stuff, deny missing docs. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, should the depth of documentation be around what you've shown today or something less or more? Yep, about around what we've seen today. And in fact, the standard library is also like a good level. Like you'll notice that um, uh, often the sort of top level documentation in the standard library is far more than it would be necessary for, for something that you're writing, right? Like this is the documentation for just like struct vec, which is a lot. And we'd absolutely not expect this much, that sort of level of documentation. But look at something like new here. Constructs a new empty vec. The vector will not allocate unless until elements are pushed onto it. Examples, blah. Or um, what's a, another good example here to use as a, this is a good one here, reserve. Reserves capacity for blah, blah, blah. Talks about some stuff. You know, here's some stuff you might want to know. Panics, right? So it panics if you do this. Right, so let us know if the thing if this function is going to crash me for some reason, or any other like additional foot guns and stuff, and then an example as a documentation test. Just this is this is an excellent example that would constitute as as Tom has been naming it. This would for sure constitute design excellence. Um, that just needs to be added to the entry point of our app, right? I'm, oh right, uh, this here, this stuff I'm assuming you're talking about. Um, yeah, you just need to put this, yes, this needs to go in the, well, um, I, you should be able to throw it in like uh, in here as well, right? Like you can throw this wherever, but it means similar to the comment bang docs, it means apply this to the thing I'm in. And so it's most common that you see this stuff here in the root level, right? The lib.rs in this case, or the main.rs, the root of the thing. So it applies to everything inside it. Um, that's where it, most people end up doing it. And this people generally like refer to this as like crate level attributes um, where this applies across the whole crate. Man, just realized reserve would have been a useful week or, a week or so back for a weekly. So I can't be, believe I missed it. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're not expected to know every single function walking into this course, but um, it's one of those standard libraries that a, a, you'll end up remembering a whole bunch of this stuff over time anyway, and B, I find this documentation, like Rust doc in particular, way easier to look through and find the things I want once you're used to it um, than, than a lot of other different kinds of, like if I pull up Java doc right now, not to like throw shade or anything, but like, um, let's look at like Java SE docs. Um, oh God, Oracle, man. I, uh, uh, Java, Java uh, stood docs. Oh God, there we go. Oh God, no man. <laughs> Show me the Java docs. Oh, what if I just do like Java string documentation? Sure. I mean, it's not like Java SE docs, API docs is what I should have typed, I typed SE docs. Um, right, this is Java doc, for example, which is like, you know, at the end of the day, for the most part, it's presenting the same kind of information, but having used, you know, Rust doc for a very long time and Java doc for an even longer um, amount of time, you know, I, I have my personal preference, but you're free to, you're free to make your own essentially. But again, at the end of the day, it's it's a very similar sort of idea um, in, in almost every language is sort of built in ideas for documentation where they have it. Um, even still, I'm looking for like package. Yeah, yeah, okay. I guess that is what I wanted. Yeah. 
there's no is there a search i don't think javadoc has a search either which is just anyway you use rust doc and decide whether you like it c++ reference oh stop <laughs> stop it you'll make me cry <laughs> um yeah so anyway at the end of the day another nice thing that we're hoping for i personally i have a personal belief that rust doc is generally pretty has like a pretty low barrier to entry like as far as i'm concerned um you know the sort of bar for writing documentation is writing slash 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 right if you can if you can go on your keyboard and do slash 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 then you can start writing documentation and like uh hello world and like markdown syntax is also very easy to use as opposed to like um you know java doc and stuff you end up getting uh you know I feel like, I don't know why, but I feel like it's stuff like this here. And then you have like at param and all these sort of like uh, weird, um, you know, weird isms, weird nomenclature and stuff that can make it difficult to just write, um, write sort of basic documentation. Um, and so the hope here as well is that using a system that's generally, yeah, and Doxygen, Doxygen and Javadoc are very closely related. Um, uh, the, the, the hope is that being given a system that lets you write documentation with a very low overhead will also help you focus on the documentation that you're writing itself. Therefore, um, thereby giving you more room to become a better, um, better at writing technical documentation, thereby giving you skills when you go back to a language that maybe it's a little more pesky to write documentation in. Um, you know, you can, you, you end up spending some of your energy dealing with that, but you already have some skills in writing some useful technical documentation. So, you know, you let us know how you go with that. Other than that, any other questions, we'll, we'll, we'll call the lecture like officially over. I think the lecture was officially over 10 minutes ago. Um, but again, as usual, I'll, I'll sit around here as long as you keep spitting, you, you all keep spitting questions in the chat. I am more than, uh, more than happy to sit here as long as, as long as we'd like. But otherwise, you know, uh, apart from any other questions, thank you everyone for coming to the lecture. Um, make sure to come to the workshops this week if you at all can, so you can... Oh, oh, that's the... Uh, b -b 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 that is the one other thing. Sorry, last thing I forgot to mention. Um, this week's workshops here, um, after the first two parts of this workshop, which is about like discussion and, and, um, and like the theory questions and stuff like that. After the first two parts of the workshop, we will split into small groups where you can work on directions lib, um, partially provided as partially working starter code. This is a library. If you can get it working, it will be useful for your assignment. Unlike other code, you may use this code in your assignment, even if somebody else in your group contributed to it. So we have some exercise for the workshop this week that literally will be really handy to just go like copy, paste into your code. And uh, like, so genuinely this workshop, if you're like not into the whole sort of workshop idea, like at, at least come along to this one because I can almost guarantee it will be useful in that you get to look at other people's code for, for a certain exercise and get feedback and stuff. You get to talk about the theory answers um, from weeks two and three, and you get to work on stuff that you can literally copy paste into your assignment. So a strong recommendation from me, the person who has been badgering you all term to continue coming to the, to the workshops. Um, a stack workshop flow. Yes, very good. Um, so I strongly recommend coming along. All right. Um, so uh, anyway, just questions. Uh, feel free to leave if you if um, if you have no questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep fielding as long as we get as long as we get them. Is there any way to auto generate docs in Rust? Like I think in many IDEs you can auto generate most of the Java doc for a particular function signature. Um, so the answer to that is mostly no, um, specifically because. Um, Rust doc, how do I say this? Java doc in particular that you're talking about is a very structured documentation language um, in that it defines, yeah, Baildong, Wikipedia, any of those work. Um, it defines like specific tokens to look for like at param or at return, at C um, that, uh, that are like semantic to the documentation generator Whereas Rust doc really just is uh, a markdown language with, you know, some additional semantics, 
Um, but at the end of the day, really just is a markdown language with none of this stuff here. So there isn't really boilerplate to generate. And a lot of this, like, um, a lot of what Rust encourages at the end of the day is if the if this stuff here, like the parameters, like what you what you're giving or what the function returns or whatever is not obvious from the type itself, then like maybe you want to rethink the way you're writing the function in the first place, right? Because we get, you know, this level of type assurance and and you know and static assurance that is tip it can be difficult to achieve in other languages. So make use of that. And at the end of the day, in the in some edge cases where you really want to like specify exactly what a parameter is, generally you'll just write that, right? You won't write like at param blah, blah, blah. You'll just go like, you know, let's say this took like x i32 whatever, and you're writing like, you know, some stuff about the function, blah, blah, blah. You just write like x is, and then here, like the boilerplate that it would generate is like, x is, you know, x is a number from uh, a number, yeah, x is the number of, of foos, you know, I'm, I'm just like making up random stuff here, right? Um, so not really, I mean, maybe Rust Analyzer does have something. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe it does some stuff when you have some types in here. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, that's cool. That's actually really cool. It saw that there's a panic in here, and so it put a panic header here and said panics if blah. That's kind of cool. But you see that there's even Rust Analyzer doesn't really think to do much because it's not that typical in Rust in particular. I wonder if it says um, if I had an unsafe function. Just this is just out of my own interest. Unsafe function, uh, unsafe foo, and it said like panic, blah. Let's see what it does here. Yeah, cool. That's what I was hoping for. So it sees it sees that it could panic, and it says panics if <laughs> panics if true. Um, and it also has this safety thing, which says, you know, in order to use unsafe foo safely, you must ensure that blah, 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 you know, this kind of docs. So yeah, there's a little bit of documentation generation, it turns out. Um, but uh, but there's, there's not much because it's not super idiomatic in Rust in particular. Um, yeah, that's pretty funny. All right, any other questions? I'll stick around for another 60 seconds until we get no more questions. No problem at all. No problem at all. Yeah, you must ensure that, you must ensure that false. <laughs> As, uh, <laughs> um, yes, yes. Alrighty, see you later. Um, I'll give another, another 15 seconds just to see if we get any more questions. But thank you all for coming. I'll clean up this in the meantime. See ya, yep, see you later. Cool, that's probably fine. Yep, all the tests pass. <clears throat> all right, no more questions. Thank you all for coming. And um, we'll leave it there. See you next time, see you next week.